my favorite headline that came out was conservative school board candidates overwhelmingly lose. I love it. So it was interesting to see this headline next to the McAuliffe loss. And I was like, this is kind of an interesting juxtaposition to see these two things going on at the same time. We got to address the suburban women problem because it's real. Welcome to the Suburban Women Problem, a podcast for red, wine, and blue. Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening. I'm Jasmine Clark. I'm Amanda Weinstein. I'm Beverly Bat, filling in again for Rachel Vidman. And you're listening to the Suburban Women Problem. Last week's election was a little disappointing, especially in Virginia, but there's still so many victories to celebrate and so much good work being done. And even when we don't win elections, there's always work we can do on a more local level. So later on, I'm going to talk to Christina Wong, an artist and activist who organized hundreds of women to make masks during the pandemic. But first, let's start with the election. Bev, you were on the ground in Virginia. Election night must have been really tough for you. Bad election parties can feel like a funeral, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's nothing more depressing, right? I mean, because it is. It is the death of a campaign when, you know, you don't win. Mm -hmm. And and especially, you know, and I know you both know this, when you have worked so hard for it, you've put your heart and soul into it. And then, you know. But but like you were saying earlier, Jasmine, there were so many wins. I mean, there were a lot in these, uh, you know, we were specifically around the Northern Virginia area, but delegates that won re-election like Danica Rome, but also just being very impressed with the women who were out here pushing back against everything that's gone on in Loudoun. Right. You know, it was hard, but... It, I am so hopeful and so um, just impressed with the caliber of women that are out there organizing in these areas. I mean, it was really interesting for me to see what happened in Virginia, but then also at the same time to see what happened to the school board candidates. So we had school board candidates here did quite well. The ones who were supporting diversity initiatives, the ones who were supporting, you know, masks for to protect our kids. They did well. My favorite headline that came out was conservative school board candidates overwhelmingly lose. I love it. So it was interesting to see this headline next to the McAuliffe loss. And I was like, this is kind of an interesting juxtaposition to see these two things going on at the same time. Would you say that in Ohio, the school board people really were like focusing on the actual issues? Yes. Um, Whereas if you kind of like contrast that to uh, McAuliffe in Virginia, I felt like they tried to um, dismiss the issues. And it 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 kind of made me think about like, you know, as a parent, there's kind of two ways to address something that's scary to your kid, right? So if you, if your kid, you're trying to get them to go to bed and they insist that, you know, there is something in their closet. um, One of the things you can do is stand there, look at them and say, there's nothing in your closet and walk away. (laughs) But that doesn't actually get rid of their fear. It doesn't help them feel like you are actually listening. Yeah, right. The other thing you could do is say, there's nothing in your closet, but I'm going to go check. I'm going to go check. I'm going to make sure And you go and you ruffle through the closet and you search up and down and you look really hard. You like, look, see, there's nothing there. And I think that that's the contrast that we saw between what happened in these local races in the suburbs versus what happened on a statewide level where statewide political consultants are like, just tell them there's nothing there. And they'll be fine. Whereas at the local level, they were like, no, I'm going to ruffle through this closet and I'm going to show you that there's nothing here. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's bigger fish to fry. Right. Like you need to go to bed. I think that's exactly right. Well, and it is all fear too, right? It's fear based. Like we were just saying, you know, a lot of the the narrative coming out, what you're seeing on Twitter and some of the takes, you know, is that it was this was completely CRT. And it's like, that was a big part of it. And we absolutely should have addressed it. Hello, we've been jumping up and down on that train for, I don't know, months. But it's also so many other educational issues, right? You have so many parents that are, you know, worried about vaccines and masks and all of this. And when it comes, when it, when you can turn and it looks like Glenn Youngkin is the only person that's talking about education at all. And all the other guys doing is talking about how much 
Youngkin is like Trump. I just don't think that's an effective strategy. No, it's like, not. yes, absolutely. Absolutely tie that person to Trump, right? Like if, if you are a Trump candidate, I want to know, but that cannot be the only reason. Granted, should it be a good enough reason? Absolutely. However, that's not how elections are won and lost. No, totally. I know. I think about it like my aunt and uncle, who I love so much. My uncle will sometimes tell a story and then he'll start on the story and be like, was this Monday or was this Tuesday the 7th? And my aunt will help him move along and she'll be like, unimportant, move on. And he goes, <laughs> okay, <laughs> he'll move along with his yeah. story. So I kind of think about that. It's like, it's like, all right, time to Trump. Okay, now move along, right? What's your next message, right. right? What else, right? And so part of it, Jasmine, I think it's like people's feelings need to be validated, right? It doesn't mean they're right. And it doesn't mean that you do what they're saying. But I think school board members are especially good at just listening, even if they don't do what you want, right? They're listening and they're saying, I hear you. And let me tell you why, for example, look, we're doing things differently than when you were in school, right? Right. We have issues with bullying. We have a more diverse school system, right? And so I think they did a good job validating the feelings. Like you might feel like your kid's going to school in a different environment than, than you did. And they are. And let me tell you why they are. Right. And so I think that is a much more supportive argument that's more effective, even if they don't get all the votes. I think some people will hear them and feel listened to and maybe even start to understand, oh, this is why they're talking more about diversity or this is why they're talking about whatever it is they're talking about, you know, history and things, you know, all of that. It's about talking about the issues in a way that resonates with people. Absolutely. But again, and this is not to rag on political consultants, because I mean, I have hired political consultants before in the past as well. But I think that sometimes they're a little um, removed Mm. from what's really important. And they're just more about like, what messaging has worked according to, you know, such and such data. Right. You know, we're in a, we're in interesting times, you know, things are different, things are changing. And I think that we have to approach politics and campaigning differently because let's be honest, more people are just paying attention than were before. Right. And so now you've got a more captive audience and they're listening to you and they're paying attention to what you say and what you don't say. Right. Well, and Jasmine, you were talking about like what's helpful, what's not helpful. Uh, my biggest pet peeve right now, and I would like to to shout out to literally the world, you know, what's not helpful, saying that CRT isn't being taught in schools, because that seems to be the default that so many are. It'll be, oh, the CRT is a college level, you know, every left progressive person has heard this parroted, right? It's a college level legal scholar, you know, scholarship or something. Right. Like that. But that's not how they see CRT. They say CRT as what it says. It's critical race theory. So if you're asking people to be critical about race or have conversations or look at things objectively, it is CRT CRT. to them. So it does not matter and is not helpful to say it's not being taught. Because when we're talking about critical race theory, if we're not talking about the actual theory, if we're talking about should we be teaching our children to think critically about race? Absolutely, we should. Right. Absolutely, we should. And we need to be out there encouraging that and being the pushback to that. Not just, I'm not going to address it, but absolutely, we have to make sure. And Amanda, I know that you've led some efforts on this, right? Yeah. But it's something that I wanted to bring up because I, I saw something on Twitter. I think it started on Friday and it was over the weekend. And there were a lot of Black voices on Twitter that were quote tweeting a headline and it was about how young is too young to be taught about racism. So I really, I, you know, I was thinking about, you know, I grew up in the suburbs of Knoxville, Tennessee, but I was thinking about the fact that the first time I was in a a class with a girl who was black, uh, I was in second grade. And I remember being afraid to drink after her out of the water fountain, because I remember hearing that black people used to have to drink out of different water fountains. So I thought it was something that was wrong with her. You know what I mean? I thought it was some kind of health thing or whatever. So I was literally, I had anxiety and fear of her, of drinking after her, that something might happen to me. And that's insane. You know what I mean? But that's, you can see how a second grader could absolutely make that conclusion. Right. Right. Well, I mean, when we had uh, Melinda Wenner Moyer on, it's as early as a few months, they can recognize race and prefer the race of their caretaker. Like that's, three months. So when should you start like thinking about it and talking about it in an age appropriate way? Uh, Basically when they're born. You know, it was something we like 
had a grown laugh out loud about at the time. But when my son was an infant, right, my husband stayed home. So I went back to work and he was very insular for the first several months of his life. And I remember him being around one year old or something like that. And us turning on Yo Gabba Gabba. <gasps> Nora loved Yo Gabba yeah, Gabba. I love she that was show. like one of the holdouts of like obsessed with it. Bless Yo Gabba Gabba. It's so good. But the first time DJ Lance popped up, my son burst out into tears. Oh. He had never seen a black person before and he was scared. And I was like, Bev, come on. My mom said that happened with my older brother. And so when I was born, like she went extra hard. Like if you look at all my baby dolls, I still have them. They're all different shades of brown. Because she, because from the point I was born, she wanted me to see different color faces. And that's so good that that, that was done for you, right? We just need to make sure that's also done for our kids when the parents don't think about it at home. Right. That's, the, that's, what, they're, that's what they're pushing back against. That's, that, that's the boogeyman is that you might have multiracial dolls in your child's kindergarten room. And that is what they're trying to make you afraid of. And, you know, to quote the people in um, Texas, you know, it makes people feel bad. But you know what? How do you think it makes Black students feel to know that their grandparents and their great grandparents actually had to go through that? And this is what I think went well with the school board is you saw a lot of women having conversations, right? They weren't doing clickbait worthy, crazy yelling, right? They were having conversations. And I think what's underestimated by the media and sometimes, sometimes like the political consultants is that that conversation can move people right? It's not a clickbait. It's not like, ooh, let's hear the salacious thing someone said. But that conversation moves people. And that's what we saw happen with the school board. And that's what I think the media doesn't get is they don't put that clickbait worthy, you know, the stuff that's not clickbait worthy doesn't get aired. But it did move people and people listen and people want to listen to that stuff. These people that won, these moms in these suburban school districts that won school board, they absolutely addressed these issues like CRT, like trans kids in sports, And actually sitting here going, these are our values, because they are. I mean, what mom wants to cause another mom's child harm, right? What mom wants to be rude to, an? you know, we want everybody to feel welcome and kind. Kindness, like being the base value there. And it's, so when you talk about that and you frame it that way, you win elections and you get rid of the fear and you drive it away and you create good and beautiful things. I think that's why we saw, like we had Maya Guy on the podcast and Maya Guy won, right? We had, especially the school board members were talking, were having conversations, right? They weren't doing crazy political things. They were having conversations over and over like Maya Guy. I did. So in Ohio, we had Sharetta Smith win. Congratulations, Sharetta. Yay. I heard about that one. Who was elected mayor in Lima, Ohio. Right. So most people know Lima because it's like the glee town. However, Lima is also, it's a small town, super blue collar, mostly white, voted for Trump. And in this election, they voted for Sharetta Smith, who is not only the first woman to be their mayor, she's also the first black person to be their mayor. And she won, right, having these conversations where she connected with people. Yeah, you know, these local races are just so important. And I'm I'm actually kind of glad that they're starting to get this much attention. Absolutely. I hope it stays this way Same. for what it's worth. I know uh, what we saw in Virginia was extremely disappointing. But at the end of the day, if at the local level we're still getting wins, that's going to matter a lot. That is so exactly right. That that is so exactly right, Jasmine. Like speak I think it points to something that is very very pivotal and completely what you just spoke to and it is sustained engagement. This is just what we do now. We are politically engaged. We don't tune out after an election cycle. Yes, you take your break, you know, your meds, oh, I'm going to, you know, a week whatever you need to do to do, you know, to to balance your mental health. But you have to stay out there. And it's not election to election. It is literally every day. And you look at, I I would love to shout out a group, the Pissed Off Mason Moms, which is the name of their group. I love that name. Yes. (laughs) Uh, And they're so great. And, you know, we first, they were one of our pilots, like working in Mason was the very first place that we went. They were organizing around a school board race and heart and soul and all of this and did so much good work. And he didn't win. But he won on Tuesday. He won last Tuesday. You know what I mean? And it's because they have never let their foot off the gas, right? Since 2019, when that, you know, that happened that first time, they are continuing, you know, 
organizing and staying involved and bringing those women together and doing stuff that is, you know, for the greater good, that's not necessarily around the election, right? They're visible, they're staying together, they're building a bench. And it's really paying off when we make these investments and continue to work and continue to get stuff done. And we do have a lot of wins. So and many we can, wins. and we have a lot of people that that weren't these weren't like expected wins. And I think these wins right? They might not be as big as the Virginia governor race was, but it doesn't mean they're any less important. And it doesn't mean they can't offer a roadmap for bigger elections. Exactly. I think we can look at these wins, whether it's Shredda Smith or Justin Bibb in Cleveland or Aftab Purval in Cincinnati. Like These people knew what to do. They had a roadmap that worked really well for them. And I think you see a history. So we had Heather McGee on the podcast. And I think it's interesting when you listen to the history of like unions and union organizing and getting change, you saw a big change start to happen when especially you had uh, union members who are white and black come together. But that is also when you had uprisings happen against it that started from, you know, the company owners who didn't want them to come together. And I think that also reminds me a little bit of what happened with Obama. I don't think it was Obama, right? I think what happened when Obama got elected you had a lot of black people and a lot of white people came together saying, we want change. And man, did that piss a whole lot of people off to finally see that this group coalesce and come together, which is exactly what happened in a lot of these mill towns that Heather McGee talks about, right? When they came together, that's when you had this small uprising violently come and squash it because we have to keep these groups separate, right? So that they don't coalesce to create this you know, greater good for them getting rid of the power structure for the few. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Everybody, if you have not read The Sum of Us by Heather McGee, please, 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 please please read it. Check out the podcast episode that she was on. It's the only one we've ever re-released because it's such an important conversation. I think she was on with us in June. Right. So just make sure if you have not yet had the opportunity um, to read that, get the audio book. Heather narrates it. That's what I did. Like hard recommend. Please, please, please read that book. But I had the strangest experience happen over the weekend. We got you know, uh, not to spoil my toast to joy, but my son got his first COVID vaccine on Saturday. And afterward, we took him to finally get his hair cut because he looked like a, a mop. <laughs> so we went just to like a super cut. And there was a woman sitting in the chair and she's talking to her hairstylist. And she's talking about the Virginia election and le- like what specifically happened in Loudoun County from a Republican perspective, right? Your ears were like, mm-hmm. Keep talking. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I was like, please, I wait for this. This is the best thing that could possibly happen to me. But she was talking about how, you know, this assault happened at Loudoun County and it was because it was a trans person who did it and it was their fault. And the father just went to the school board to try to get some help, you know, and they escorted him out of there and arrested him. And it's like, oh my God, this is why they win. This is why they win. Because it just sound if you don't know, it sounds so reasonable, right? Right. And seeing that play out in real time was very interesting but also a little terrifying. Yeah. So it's just, we have to, we have to, we have to keep talking about it. Yeah. And McAuliffe needed to have that conversation, right? Let's have a conversation about sexual assault. Let's have a conversation about how Virginia does not require consent in their education, right? Let's have that conversation. Let's not dismiss the feelings, right? Let's validate, you know, that sexual assault is wrong. We need to be teaching consent, but that conversation didn't really happen. It felt more like it got dismissed which reminds me, Jasmine, last week on the podcast, we talked about your consent bill. And I feel like we should come back to that because a lot of people are like, when we have these feelings, right? The Me Too movement, right? It seems like, yes, this is wrong, right? Sexual assault is wrong, but what can we do about it, right? And I think this turning, this feeling of I don't like this into something real, tangible policy right. is so important. And which is why it's so important to have you know diverse representatives, men, women, different color, different races represented in our you know political system. Absolutely. And I have the bill. It's being drafted now. Woo-hoo. I think that's how you answer it by just saying, all right, you're right. I actually agree with you. We need to do something about assault. This is what I'm going to do. And actually do something instead of just being like, oh, yeah, I think you're just blowing this out of proportion. And 
not addressing it in a way that makes people feel like you actually care. So you're saying that you're going to, this is legislation to cause our children to think critically around sexual anything. So are you, are you advocating the teaching of, of, of critical sex theory? Is that what you're proposing here in your legislation? You know what? I would not be surprised. Don't give them the words, I'd be surprised if that does not come up eventually. And it's like now. Critical consent theory. Come on. CCT. CCT. Oh gosh, I'm so ready. When I think about this, that's like me taking action, but I'm a state legislator, so I can do that. I can go into legislative council and say, draft this bill. But you know, if you're not a state legislator, you might be like, well, what are some things that I can do? And one way is through craftivism, which is a word that I think is extremely cute. (laughs) I love it. It's a way to basically reclaim what are considered like um, our traditionally female skills that have been devalued by men throughout history and then actually make it very valuable. Let's do something tangible to kind of take back the things that have been devalued by our society. And activism. We have this narrow view of what activism is. Like when my aunt didn't knit us all pink hats, that wasn't activism, but it clearly was activism, right? So we get this narrow view of activism is like, you know, going door to door or speaking to someone or going to a meeting. But activism is so much more than that. Well, and it's all about bringing what your inherent talents are, right, to what you can do. You're, you're talking to somebody that went to art school. Like that was, uh, but I then have used that to do graphic design and create content and kind of go up from there. I'm also really sad Rachel's not here this week because she is like Martha Stewart. I know. I'm not the crafter. I remember, you know, uh, one time when I was unemployed making coasters with uh, World War II propaganda posters. You know what I mean? That were very sexist or whatever, because I thought those, you know, that's fun. And it's, Love it. it's just a way to express yourself too, but you can't actually do it, you know, because we, what we did was we sold those to raise money, right? And so it is is uh, one of those things where you can do something creative, have an outlet, and also benefit a cause and do something good. I love it. And women have been doing this all along, like even if it's with like bake sales, right? Oh, yeah. We are known for our bake sales, right? And are we doing it just because we're like, bake sales are fun and I love baking? Like, well, yeah, sure, maybe. But also we're using what we love to do. So, you know, I'm a better baker than I'm a crafter, right? Baking to like raise money for our schools. Like, we know women do this. We just didn't call that activism, but it absolutely is activism. Right. I wonder if there's like misogyny tied into that or something. Like it couldn't <laughs> be qualified as activism because it was through a female gaze. I mean, probably not, right? Well, that's okay. It can be like covert activism. So oh, I love that. <laughs> it's like an undercover form of activism where they think we're just baking cookies and sewing and really we're like taking over the world. <laughs> over the last thousand years. What Christina Wong has managed to do with bringing all these people together to sew masks, using how that ties in traditionally with like her, with her culture and stuff like that. Super, super interesting. I'm so excited and jealous you got a chance to talk to her. On that note, we're going to take a quick break. And then after that, we'll have my interview with Christina Wong. Um, and interestingly, I had to interview her for my office at the state house because we are in special session right now. Um, so be sure to stick around for that interview coming up after the break. Do you feel like you could use some support figuring out how to respond to anti-mask, anti-vax, or anti-CRT messaging in your community? We invite you to sign up for one of our Troublemaker trainings. They're fun events where you can meet other women who are facing this stuff too, and learn strategies to stand up for the kids in your community. You can find more details and show notes or at mobilize.us slash USA. Our guest today is a performer, a writer, and a community activist. She has a new off-Broadway show about leading a sewing squad during the pandemic, and she was just profiled by the New York Times. Christina Wong, thank you so much for joining us on The Suburban Women Problem. Hello, fellow representative of America. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Your new off-Broadway show is all about how you formed a team to sew thousands of masks for vulnerable people during the pandemic. Uh, So number one, that is awesome. Number two, I wish I knew how to sew. And so I love that y'all are doing this. But uh, can you tell me about your show and about your auntie sewing squad? Yes. 
I started on March 24th, 2020, uh, four days after sewing my first mask on a Hello Kitty sewing machine. And I'm not a good seamstress either. I sew the set and prop pieces for my solo shows, but I've never sewn anything of function, you know? And uh, I very naively made this offer to the internet that I would make masks for anyone who needed it, not realizing everyone needed it. And I was like, I need to form a group or something. I need help. I describe it. It's very Lord of the Flies. It's It always is. I feel like America, Lord of the Flies. Same thing, <laughs> right? No. But anyone in a crisis who expresses some sense of leadership, like suddenly I was just like, okay, you know, by default, I became this leader because I started the Facebook group. Anyway, so the, the show is called Christina Wong's Sweatshop Overlord. <laughs> the the terrible joke, the terrible gallo humorous joke at the top of all this, because the first volunteers were all Asian women. I was just like, oh, my God, this is like an ancestral uh, destiny. Yes. I'm running a sweatshop. This is like completely not what my grandmother probably wanted for me, but it's something out of necessity. And, you, and a lot of us learn to sew from our mothers and grandmothers who did it because that's what they did for survival. And so it's just this nickname that has stuck. They all call me the overlord. And and this is the show is basically me taking us through 504 days of this pandemic. Uh, and what I thought was going to just be like a little three-week project, and then we would reopen. Um, but we ended up sewing for about 16 months, you know, uh, and and seeing the entire world from the back of our sewing machines. And that means like sewing masks for BLM protesters uh, in Minneapolis uh, and across the world, frankly, and, and sewing for volunteers of the New Georgia Project. And like basically all these, like a lot, many of the places we sent to um, were communities that were already getting the brunt of systemic racism and structural violence. Uh, they weren't getting federal help before this, and they certainly weren't now. So so yes, so that's the story of this crazy show, which I didn't even intend to make at the top of this, but that's what happens. I will say our community that we built ended up becoming about 800 aunties. Wow, 800? Yeah, most sewing groups were usually were forming regionally for the local hospitals in their area. But, you know, because I was not, I didn't really come in with a super plan, like just everyone joined. And so we just had this, but it ended up being very useful because we were able to sort of utilize aunties who are in certain regions to to help be points for stuff. So when there were fires happening in Northern California that were affecting fi- uh, farm workers, one of our aunties, we sent all these uh, masks to her so that she could be the pickup point. I love it. So you use comedy to talk about some less than funny subjects, uh, like being Asian American during a pandemic where a lot of Americans have basically been scapegoating people um, who look like you and who look like your family. So what's that process like, basically taking something that's difficult and turning it into something funny? Yeah, I um, I will say when I think about how to draw humor out of a terrible situation. Um, it's, it's not the, the instinct is not like, Oh, let's make fun of people who are being hate crimed or let's make light of this. That's usually not the strategy. It's, it's, it's going, what are these ridiculous power systems in place or the illogic that is letting people think that all Chinese people have the virus or that, that let's, let's go beat up on Asian people because we think they're the ones who brought this here. And so, and it's trying to get at the root and uh, the logic of why this happens. So some points of humor around this, and there aren't, there aren't a ton. I do, I do get into it as my mother and I took a self-defense workshop together on zoom and, and just sort of like me and my mom are on the floor kicking an invisible racist in the nuts together. I love that. <laughs> it was very physical. Like I, I, she was signed. She was hardcore. She was going every week. And I was like, kind of like, like trying to avoid going because it was so exhausting. This is the one time I did it with her <laughs> and just thinking like, why are we kicking like hundreds of, of kicks in the air at some point, someone's going to come help us. Right. <laughs> I'm like, this is so unfortunate and and terrible that, you know, mothers and daughters are not bonding over tea. We're like practicing k- kicking invisible people in the nuts. And, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's, <laughs> but a lot of what, how, how we have survived as aunties is just the humor that we had about our whole situation. Like I can't believe we're so, and I can't believe we're, we're running a shadow FEMA. <laughs> I can't believe that government has stepped in. I can't believe that States can't get on the same page that everyone should be wearing masks. Right. Like, so these right. are the things that we yeah. find a joke about with each other, but you know, we have all this kind of humor 
that would help us laugh through this situation. Yeah, I know the whole laugh to keep from crying thing. Yeah. And I also think a lot of comedians, um, uh, Black comedians as well, will sometimes kind of make light of racism and make jokes about racism as a way to kind of like add levity to some pretty horrible things that, you know, happen. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it, as I felt like we were in a war, it's like if a war played out in the fabric section of Joanne's, <laughs> It, it really felt like we were, th- instead of throwing bullets, we were throwing masks at different communities to protect them. And and so that imagery really plays out in the show where I, instead of like an ammo belt like Rambo, I have an ammo belt, but it's filled with thread. We, we have one auntie, I call her Auntie Fauci, because she would like literally look at water charts in different indigenous communities. She would look at political conditions because we we couldn't help everybody, right? But we, we could make strategic right, yeah. drops to where we thought the need was most. So she was, she determined the governor of North Dakota lifted, wouldn't put in a mass mandate, was lifting checkpoints um, that the folks of Standing Rock and other Lakota, the Lakota tribe were very vulnerable. And so we, we, we like directed a lot of our help there. And I was just like, this is, we are like a little army of aunties. So speaking of helping others, um, I'm an elected official here in Georgia. And in addition to being a performer, you also actually hold public office. I do. I'm on the Koreatown Neighborhood Council. I rep- I'm i Subdistrict 5 representative. Subdistrict 5 is the half square mile I live in. And it's a volunteer position. But yes, I've, I've, I've gotten to witness a lot being on this inside and also on the outside doing you know mutual aid projects like the Auntie Sewing Squad and and also being an artist and trying to understand where power comes from and where community really comes from. What made you decide to run? Like what made you decide to switch from like kind of community activism to public office? Well, I, I, I use a lot of satire uh, when Obama was still in office where I'd make fun of myself a ton. Um, and I, I often played a version of myself that made fun of myself as an active, as like an overzealous activist who, who didn't, always have the right strategy to things. And that didn't read very well once Trump took office. It actually looks sort of like a real thing. So I have a web series called Radical Cram School where I have a beret on. I'm running like a little Girl Scout troop of radical Asian American young girls oh and kids. Gosh. And uh, I think it just read as the real deal to a lot of people on the right. They were like, oh my God, she's brainwashing children. And, you know, for me, it was like kind of tongue in cheek. Yeah. <laughs> so I sort of realized I can't, I was like, I, this self-satirizing persona, it doesn't read anymore because we live in a world where the politicians are the spectacle. Literally, politicians and artists have switched jobs. They're they're creating shock and spectacle that that has us questioning their reality. And the artists are the ones who are now left to try to reclaim the possibility for change and hold space for earnestness. And I thought, okay, if these politicians are going to take my job, I'll take theirs. I'll run for office and I'll do a show about it called Christina Wong for Public Office. So I I wanted to I would have loved to run for something larger. It is a huge financial commitment, as you probably know. It is. Yes. Oh, yes. I am familiar. But I just to really take myself through the process of 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 could I do this better rather, you know, I, there's only so much that I could be on a stage complaining about the government, but I think the way to really enter the situation was to be the government and see, see what I re- could report back to my audiences. And I think it's been a, in a really an amazing, powerful combination as it turns out, no one really understands what anyone in office actually does. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of people come to me and they, they think I know everything. Yeah. And I can tell you as a, as someone who both ran a mutual aid group and as elected in office, I got more done for my community outside of my elected office. Right. The elected office, it's like we all have to kind of reach a consensus and vote. Our budget that we're allotted is very small to distribute in terms of aid. And But I was able to, like, something about mutual art has... Uh, Mutual aid has this, I should call it mutual art. Mutual aid is sort of an anarchy where we can just throw support where it right. needs to be. Yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 got, I, I do it. I am frustrated with it. Um, it's, but it's helping me understand, okay, these are the systems we have. And I think it's very naive to, to hope that the government will fix things for us and we just kick back, right? We we have to really get in there and be involved and also sometimes step in and, and save ourselves. Right. So in addition to all of that, you also helped write a book. So you're like yes. a super amazing person. <laughs> what do you hope that readers might learn from your book about community care and mutual aid? Yes. Thank you for you know, our book is this beautiful anthology, which was pumped out during the pandemic on a very, like we're still in the pandemic. And now there's a book about our group that sort of uh, captures 
the dynamic of how we worked across the country with each other. I think that there's something to be said about giving generously in times of crisis. And um, I, I was sort of shocked to see this side of myself because I thought at the end of the world, I would be you know, running up the freeway with all my stuff and fighting off people with a pipe. And it would be like <laughs> end games, hunger games, whatever. But instead I'm like helping all these people. And I think that that was actually the better way to go because panic after a while, panic is just, you know, loose, crazy energy, but, but not that helping isn't filled with fueled by its own panic. But I think that that gave our aunties a sense of purpose, um, a sense of direction in a time that was very scary. And then we suddenly had a community with each other that was supporting each other as we survived through this. And we felt way less isolated. I know a lot of folks, unfortunately, felt very isolated at home because they weren't able to see anybody. Uh, not that we saw each other all the time, but we saw each other online. And I know this group was a way for a lot of us to survive. So I would say in times of crisis, look to the helpers, like try to find the people who are, who are supporting and think about what power do you have in this situation? Because you have something, you have some sort of power. We had people who, who couldn't sew, but they would help by cutting or by driving fabric to another auntie across town or doing a mail run for us. And these are things that we consider all in a pandemic sort of death defying, right? Right. Um, but and they, and they did it because it was important for them to feel like they could be of use and, and helpful and experience like feeling appreciated by this community at large. So that is what I really hope the people leave with, because this is not our first crisis in our lifetimes. Um, it, and it's, it's not our last and like, don't wait, don't wait for the government to help. <laughs> we, we thought that the government would show up with masks for everybody. Um, and that never happened. So we had to step in. It literally still has not happened. Yeah, it's not happened. <laughs> like, it still hasn't happened. Yeah. So we are now going to switch over and uh, we're going to go into our rapid fire question. Sure. You actually developed your one woman show on Zoom before you brought it to live audiences this year. Mm -hmm. So what's the best thing about performing live instead of on Zoom? A full range of motion. That I don't, because <laughs> I'm just looking into the camera the whole time and screaming. I think hearing the audience feedback, seeing them, just seeing people again is really weird. I, I, I the, the third line in, I'm like, live theater is back. And just to see everyone scream and get excited, whereas Zoom, it was like, hopefully that joke landed. Hopefully that joke landed. I'll have to read the chat later to see if this, if anyone was even listening or if they wandered off to the, to do dishes or something. So much is great. And then getting to just see people I haven't seen in years afterwards who've come all the way to see the show. So what was the weirdest response you've ever gotten to your work? Oh, so many. Um, I think it's, hmm. <laughs> I think it's when, when I, I did this piece called A Funeral for a White Man's Penis, where I had a big <laughs> six foot fabric penis on a stage. And there are people who are like, she's calling upon the death of all white men. And I'm like, no. No, no, no. Calm down. But like, this is where I'm saying like, people just don't understand satire and they, they go, they get all insane. And I, I think I'm mostly going to name, yeah, it's mostly been scary responses. It was Alex Jones of Infowars watched Radical Cram School and said, this is a uh, radical communist indoctrination for children. Uh, this is the most racist thing you've ever seen. I'm like, have you not watched your own show? Like, I don't oh understand. Gosh. So it was oh my gosh. very weird plus scary uh, that there's a whole world that doesn't understand satire and <laughs> yes I've noticed this on the internet as well where I'm like y'all do realize this is not real all right what's harder getting people to vote or getting people to laugh getting people to vote totally getting people to vote it's way harder yeah yeah I, I I can attest to that as a person who has run for office it is very hard to get people to vote I make people laugh on a daily basis <laughs> all right so what is your favorite reality show that's terrible but you love it anyway I during the pandemic I've gotten into the bachelor Rhett and uh bachelor in paradise I can't even believe it I, I swore I would never watch those shows but then once they started having leads of color I was like oh let me let me see how they deal with this <laughs> And then I was like, it's pretty clear how it's gonna, it's going to play out. And there's spoilers all over the internet, but I still watch these long ass episodes. You know, I've actually never seen any of them. I've only seen like commercials for them. And like, again, read like the aftermath online somewhere, but I've never actually watched a show. Maybe I'll check it out one day. So who was your first teen heartthrob crush? I think it's, it was Mike Andretti, who was a... Uh, outfielder for the San Francisco Giants. I thought he was just so cute. And then in the 
Royce Clayton was a shortstop. They're all athletes. All right. So you've been getting a lot of interviews and coverage lately, which is amazing. So what's your dream interview and who would you most be excited to be interviewed by? Whoa, that's a great question. Can I, I, maybe I just go with a good old fashioned Oprah. Just a good old fashioned Oprah. That's fair. That's fair. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, to get on Oprah's couch, I think it's, that'd be awesome. Well, that is the end of our rapid fire questions. So where can our listeners go to find out more about you and your work? Yeah, you go to ChristinaWong.com. My name starts with a K. And uh, the show is playing till the end of the month at New York Theater Workshop. So that's NewYorkTheaterWorkshop.org, I believe. Um, And the show's Christina Wong Sweatshop Overlord. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Christina, for joining me today on The Suburban Women Problem. Welcome back, everyone. Jasmine, I loved your interview with Christina. So my favorite part was this imagery of her doing the self-defense, like kicking in the air. And she's like, all right, who is going to finally come help us? Like we've just been kicking in the air for so long. Featuring her and her mom, like laying on the floor, like kicking imaginary testicles. <laughs> it's just like, oh, this is this is great. I love this. The I racist love this. balls they're <laughs> kicking. Yeah, racist <laughs> testicles. I, I love it. Personally, I'm going to incorporate it into my workout routine. <laughs> Uh, But, well, on that note, on kicking the balls of racist, (laughs) uh, it is now time for our Toast to Joy, which is where we each share something amazing that happened to us in the past week or a policy that we're really excited about. So, Amanda, why don't you start us off? What's your Toast to Joy? So my Toast to Joy today is we actually got to go to a little Diwali celebration, which was my first one. And it was so great because we got to see a lot of performers and a lot of singers And we got to kind of experience the food and the culture put on by Tana and Neota here. And like when I go experience something like that, I think like if you knew the culture, I feel like there is no way you can walk away from there, like having racism in your heart because you see the love. And I love that Diwali is about kind of victory of light over darkness. So it's a super uplifting kind of celebration. And so it was super fun. I loved it. Well, and I was looking at everybody's Instagram stories from the Diwali celebrations, like yes. like uh, Mindy Kaling and all of these other people going to really cool parties. And it was the first time I really remember seeing that. And it actually did make me think of CRT, you know, this controversy around it. It's like, oh, you just don't want to, like, somebody's worried that you might learn about this. I, I want to know how I get an invite. Like, who's going to invite me to the cool Diwali? I'm planning my outfit. I am ready to go. <laughs> Like, absolutely. I'm ready. Mindy Kaling, if you want to call me, I'll take it. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Beverly, what's your toast to joy? Well, my toast to joy, I alluded to a little bit earlier. You know, it was the moment for type A moms because the vaccine, we got clearance for it. And literally every type A mom that I know was like, hunting, uh, looking for the, right. It was mission impossible music. It was finding the closest vaccine, you know, where they have it, like shout out to your friends, family, loved ones that you got your kid vaccinated. You can be that person in your community. That is the, you know, everybody, nobody wants to be first. There's, I mean, other than me, I really wanted to be first, but uh, uh, let me exit off my soapbox and ask (laughs) Jasmine, what is your toast to joy this week? I keep having sports ones, but I don't know. Maybe I'm just in a sports mood. This is like my season. Um, You're like, you're sport. You are a sporty spice. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, Really important though. Then who are the rest of us? I'd be the economist spice. (laughs) So you're posh spice. Okay. Uh, I'm scary spice, obviously. And then Rachel would then have to be, uh, Rachel's Jerry, right? Rachel has to be ginger spice. Okay. Anyways, that was really important to me. So anyways, Jasmine, continue. Right. Um, So on sports, um, Atlanta sports are doing amazing. So obviously we know Atlanta um, won the world series and then the Atlanta Falcons won against their arch rivals, the New Orleans Saints, which is like a really big deal here in Atlanta. It's just a great time to be an Atlanta sports fan. And I don't really get a lot of things that I can get excited about. I mean, I'm just kind of like always working, but sports are like my little getaway. That's my, I guess, my self-care during the fall. And so I'm really excited just to have some some 
good news on the sports front. So that's my toast to joy. I love that. It's also for my husband. When he's like having a day, I'm like, go watch some football. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much to everyone for joining us today. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a rating and a review. We'll see you again next week on another episode of the Suburban Women Problem. The Suburban Women Problem was created by Red, Wine, and Blue. Our executive producer is Beverly Batt. Our producer and editor is Amy Thorstenson, and our video producer is Ashley Hufford. If you're ready to be part of the Suburban Women Problem, head over to redwine.blue and sign up for our newsletter so you don't miss a thing.